Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA is a membership organisation. It exists solely for the purpose of advocating on behalf of and helping to support and helping to organise animal study scholars. It's also very open to having members drawn from people who are animal study students, PhD students, master's students, honours students, even undergraduate students. So membership is very affordable at just 50 Australian dollars a year and that's for the waged people. So it's a little bit cheaper if you're, if you're a student. So if you're not a member of ASA, please think about joining Having members is what facilitates them doing their good work on behalf of animal study scholars. So think about joining ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now this episode of Knowing Animals is also brought to you by MC Pony. I've been talking to you quite a bit about MC Pony over the past few weeks. Of course, MC Pony is the wonderful, talented woman who brought us the intro music to this podcast, Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan. She's a hip-hop artist, she's a songwriter, she's an animal advocate, she's someone who's very passionate about animal issues and very giving of her time and energy to support animal causes. And she would like you to support her by checking out her website, which is Vegan Thused. That's V-E-G-A-N-T-H-U-S-E-D dot com. And if you miss that, you can just put MC Pony into Google and you'll get there really quickly. So check out MC Pony. Now, the final ad for this podcast is an ad for this podcast. Why not, why not uh, fund myself to advertise a little bit? Now, once a month I get an email telling me if anyone has left a new review for the podcast on iTunes. Regularly I feel a um, sense of disappointment when the email says no new reviews. But this month I did get a new review from a listener in the UK. So it was Amy Gadelli 72 And she writes, as an MA student, I'm so grateful this podcast was introduced to me last week. Knowing animals functions as a warmly presented and succinct entry point in the topics I hope to think through as I engage with animals and the environment. Well, thank you so much for that review. Reviews are really important because when they're left at iTunes, it means the podcast trends upwards It becomes one of the first podcasts on animal issues people see and therefore it makes it easier for other people to find us. So if you listen to this podcast and you enjoy it and you want to do something to support it, leaving a review at iTunes is a simple way you can support this podcast and help spread the word. Okay, that's all the ads. Now let's get down to the business, the good stuff. Well, once again, we're here in beautiful Sheffield town It is quite late in the year, but the sun is shining. It's a glorious day. Sheffield's really pulled out all the stops. And I'm I'm here in my beautiful little office with my lovely view. And I'm really lucky to be joined this week by someone who I've been wanting to get on the podcast for quite a few years. And today it's finally happened. I'm joined by Dr. Steve Cook. Steve is a lecturer in political theory at the University of Leicester. Steve was here at the University of Sheffield and he'll be very well known to a lot of animal studies scholars and listeners of this program. Today we're going to discuss Steve's article, Imagined Utopias, Animal Rights and Moral Imagination, which appeared in the Journal of Political Philosophy in 2017. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Hi. (laughs) Okay, Steve. Why this article? What inspired it? 
Uh, so I think it was, it was while I was doing my PhD, um, and I remember a moment walking back after a seminar, and I was chatting to my supervisor, and I'd had a lot of conversations with people uh, about my research, and I remember having a lot of uh, discussions where people went, well, I'm convinced by the argument for vegetarianism, but I couldn't be vegetarian myself or vegan. And that bothers me, right? So I remember chatting to my supervisor in, 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 in that walk to the pub, and she said, do you think that people really believe that if they aren't motivated to act on those beliefs? There's the parallel of, of moral motivation. Um, and that sort of sat in the back of my head for, I don't know, the last 20, 2011, 2010? So it's sitting there for seven or eight years, um, bothering me. Uh, and then some colleagues in uh, Leicester and in Warwick put on a, a seminar in Leicester and just said, come and write about whatever you want. Present on anything. Uh, and that freedom allowed me to still really start thinking about these issues and, and push on there. So that's that's how it happened, just having that freedom and that, that question bothering me for years. <laughs> it's amazing how important those passing conversations mm. are. And it, that's one of the reasons I'm so grateful that we have a community of scholars now because we can have those passing conversations and spark ideas in each other's minds. So, Steve, you're interested in justice for animals. Yep. What is justice when we think about animals? What does that word mean in relation to animals? So, I think about justice as a, it's a special area of morality um, where uh, the kind of uh, moral rules to term decided by justice are obligatory. They're not ones that you can opt out of. It's not like charity uh, where, you know, it wouldn't be charity if you could choose not to if you couldn't choose not to. Uh, justice is an enforceable area of morality. If you don't don't meet your moral obligations in regard of justice, then it can be right to coerce you uh, to carry out those obligations. That's mm. how I think of justice anyway. Mm. Uh, and it's an, an explicitly sort of... It's often described in the, in the language of rights and duties. So it's an, uh, very strongly connected with uh, political morality. So it's a, an important part of political morality and it's an area of enforceable morality. Mm. So it's, it's an enforceable morality. It's something that we are obliged to do. It's not something that we choose to do. Mm -hmm. And in your research or in this paper, what you're interested in is identifying what is stopping us or, as you say, constraining us from being able to move towards a society that is just for animals. Yeah. So what is constraining us? So... I think one of the things that I, I think there are lots of things, but one of the things that I think that's constraining us is just, it's really difficult to imagine that world. Um, and it's really hard to agitate for and to fight for a world that you struggle to imagine. Um, and so you don't get motivated. So I think a lot of people just can't imagine what that world would look like. So they don't even think of it as a possibility. And if you discount it as a possibility, you're not going to try and realize it. Um, so I think that's part of the problem. So, how do you then argue that case in the paper? What what would you like us to start imagining or how might we start doing that work of imagining? So, I think a, a lot of the animal, the justice, animal justice literature is about what's the world like, right? What's the imagined possibility? What's the utopia where we get justice for non-human animals? Uh, and in the paper, what I'm trying to do is actually think about what conditions need to be in place for us to be able to imagine that. Um, so I think about the steps we need to take in order to get to justice. And one of those is about giving us the tools to think about it, to imagine it, um, to be better at moral reasoning, uh, to be better at sympathizing with non-human animals uh, and with other humans. Um, so I think um, about the kind of world where we would give people the tools to do that. Um, to, so, and I think, one good answer is potentially uh, just making people better at imagining. So uh, making more, or putting more effort into funding arts, humanities, literature, philosophy, um, all those things that make life good in other ways uh, also make us better at imagining ourselves in other people's shoes, better at imagining uh, morally. So when we reason about uh, how we ought to act, we compare a, a possible world with our own world 
um, we imagine sort of counterfactuals. Uh, we imagine a hypothetical scenarios that, where the world might be different. Uh, and you need a set of building blocks to imagine those worlds. So I'm thinking about the kind of conditions in society we might use to give people those building blocks. Um, and that, what's, what's good about that is it doesn't require us to think um, or to agitate necessarily straight away for that animal utopia. It's a step towards that. You don't have to agree that animals ought to be owed rights, be included within justice to think, wouldn't it be great to fund the arts? <laughs> Right, mm -hmm. you can you can do that even for people who disagree. Yeah. So I think that's the sort of a little a first step we can take before we start moving on towards that utopia for non-human animals. Yeah, it was fascinating, Steve, because my previous, I guess, interactions with you intellectually about animal issues has been around you know things like trespass mm -hmm. and civil disobedience and that kind of thing. So I kind of think of you as a bit of a. Um, you know, let's go and raid the farm tonight kind yeah, let's of Let's go smash up some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was most surprised by this article. I hadn't read it before mm -hmm. except in preparation for this. And when you took the turn towards the arts, I was really uh, – I wasn't anticipating it at all. But it was fascinating because in the animal studies community where we hold conferences, we usually do have a parallel um, – art exhibition or some kind of engagement with art and so it's fascinating to hear this defense of the imagining and the creative engagement with animal yeah. issues yeah and i mean i also remember reading black beauty as a girl and and that was that was significant so it's about imagining it's it's also about emotional engagement yeah. and empathy why does that matter so it's a question of moral motivation right what well, when we think about uh, what, what we ought to do, to think about right and wrong and how we ought to act, um, one way we do that is by imagining ourselves in someone else's shoes. Uh, we, we, take, we take the perspective of someone else or we imagine the reasons they have for acting. And if we think they have better reasons than uh, the ones they acted under, then we, we might blame them for what they did. If we think they had a, a, better, char a better choice. Uh, if we didn't, don't think they had a better choice, then we praise them perhaps. Um, and that's a sort of third-person perspective. We're, we're sort of um, um, thinking about the reasons they have. But we can also take a first-person perspective of how they are thinking and feeling and what's motivating them. Um, and when we think, when we do that, we're sort of engaging in almost sim in, in the first step in building sympathy with them. Uh, if, we, if we feel as they do, if we think we, were in this, we feel ourselves in their shoes, we think we would feel similarly to them, and we can then understand why they acted then we become sympathetic with them. And I think that's, a, that's an important step in being morally motivated. We're more likely to be motivated to act if we're in sympathy with someone. right? Um, and it's easier to f form sympathetic bonds with people you know well. You can understand the motivations of people who are like you. It's easy to be unsympathetic to people who are distant from you. Um, and I think that's one of the problems we have with m moving towards... Uh, just state of affairs for non-human animals is that some animals are really hard to sympathise with. Right? They're really weird, ugly ones. It's that famous paper from Nagel, What Is It Like to Be a Bat, where he says it's really, you know, it's impossible for us to imagine what it's like to experience the same sort of phenomenological world, the sense of feelings and emotions that a bat has. We don't have the same senses. Uh, so we can't put ourselves in its shoes. Whereas with those animals we can really easily identify with. It's much easier. So I think there's a, there's a problem in f being motivated to act on behalf of some animals because of this sort of experiential gulf. It's so hard to imagine what it's like to be them. And therefore, it's really hard to sympathise and be motivated. Do you know what we should do in the case of these really hard to empathise with animals? Well, I think one of the things is not depending upon sympathy. Right. So some accounts ask us just to build these sympathetic bridges and act from sympathy. And uh, I think it's important that we're aware of it and that it's a difficulty um, and that we cultivate a mindset that allows us to see beyond that. Um, so in other papers I've, I've written about a sort of cosmopolitan mindset um, of just being open to difference um, and being aware that we can't step into their shoes. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have moral concern for them. There are plenty of other good reasons to have moral concern. Just being able to sympathise is not enough. Yeah. So cosmopolitanism also uh, gets a very favourable mention in this paper. Mm -hmm. 
Can you start by telling listeners what cosmopolitanism is? So on a very, very simple level, it's the idea that what makes us morally considerable uh, or whether we have rights or duties, whether we ought to act on behalf of someone or for them, isn't down to whether we have a special relationship with them. That there's a sort of a universal principle that we owe duties, we owe moral respect to others no matter who they are, where they are, uh, whether we're in a community with them, whether we've signed a contract with them, um, whether we know them. So it's a way of, of building moral relationships or, ha- or saying that we have a moral relationship even with distant strangers. And I, I think that cosmopolitan community also includes non-human animals. Mm. So you see that that capacity within cosmopolitanism is offering us something that we could translate o- across to the non-human animal world. Yes, yeah. Uh, and it's not just a set of rights and duties that we have, but also a mindset of being open, um, welcoming almost. So what the first earliest accounts in, in sort of modern political philosophy, the Kant's famous um, account of, of cosmopolitanism, he talks about it in terms of hospitality, of offering hospitality to strangers not turning them away at your door, not meeting them with aggression if they're peaceful. I think we can we can translate those principles to non-human animals as well. Mm. So, Steve, for someone, say, living in suburban Leicester, mm-hmm. reading this article, is there a call to action in here? And if so, what is it? So I suppose in that paper... Um, the, the 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 first step I think is that is to think about whether we ought to as a society encourage certain ways of building our society, uh, and so I think the preconditions we need are, are first of all um, a commitment to the arts, a commitment to literature and art um, and culture, but also uh, a willingness to challenge cultural norms. So we need the kind of society that gives us the freedom to challenge certain ways of living, right? So some political theories, or political philosophies will be reticent to challenge culture, history, um, the ways of living we already have, the sort of more conservative ways of thinking. We'll, we'll think that culture's valuable, um, but won't want to challenge it, right? Because it says that culture's valuable because it teaches us something about how we, we ought to live. It's been successful. Um, I think the sort of stuff you see in the work of John Stuart Mill, where he encourages eccentricity, uh, resisting cultural norms, uh, new forms of expression and ways of living, um, that's going to provide us with the, you know, the possibility of changing the world. Um, and when we combine that with having a, a stronger imagination, I think that's that's the thing that I want. Um, so the next step for me is really trying to encourage or think about whether or not I can create a strong argument for um, state funding of the arts on grounds of justice and improving society rather than in terms of it's a good thing that we have it, therefore we ought to spend money on it. Right? Um, that's standardly the, the argument for the arts is it's a nice thing, people like it, therefore we ought to spend money on it. Um, and that's, of course, if you don't like the arts, you say, well, we want a, a liberal society where the state doesn't tell us how we ought to live, doesn't tell us how we ought to spend our money, so that's a bad thing. Um, but if it's a condition of justice of being better at moral reasoning about reaching towards how we ought to live, then that's a different kind of argument. So that's that's where I'm going to go with next, I think. Fascinating. I mean, I, I have a great deal of um, time f- for what you're saying. I, I find it persuasive. But I just wonder if you feel a bit disheartened in the current political climate. It seems to me that there's a trend away from supporting the arts. Yeah, and I think that's because people see the arts as what we call a a discretionary public good, right? It's a nice add-on, but when things are tight, you start cutting away those nice add-ons and you try to secure people's rights. Um, So if the argument is not, it's a discretionary add-on, but it's the necessary condition or an important condition of securing rights in the first place, it's much harder to cut away at that. Um, So yeah, I am a little disheartened. Um, but I think there are good, there are potentially good arguments, that the ones I want to work on next, that maybe give us something to resist that with. Wonderful. Well, Steve, I ask everybody who comes on Knowing Animals to answer five quick questions. Yep. Are you ready for your five quick indeed. questions? 
Can you recall the first piece of pro animal scholarship you ever read? Yeah, so this is actually interesting. I, re- I think, first of all, I read uh, Mary Midgley's uh, Animals and Why They Matter. And when I say I read it, I, I didn't really read it. Right? I, I was working on a piece of, uh, on an essay. I probably read a chapter. Um, and this, this uh, the, knowing I was coming to this actually called me to, caused me to pull that book out of my bookshelf and, and properly read it for the first time. Oh. Uh, so I read through the whole thing again. Um, and it's a lovely book. She's got a, a, a brilliant talent for just cutting through bullshit. Um, she, she, so the book itself is it's an exploration of the kind of um, rationalizations and reasons that people have for not granting animals proper moral concern. So she just goes through them and finds way uh, and, and picks holes in the arguments. Um, and it's the kind of work that's only possible if you've got a, a real breadth of scholarship from across philosophy and all sorts of other disciplines. I enormously admire her work. The older I get, the more I have, more time I have for Mitchley's work, actually. It's, it's a lovely book. I'd encourage people to read that. Wonderful. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? So I don't know whether that's a published piece or, or the, the first piece I wrote was for my MA. I, I, I wrote a, I was reading John Rawls' Theory of Justice. I was very unhappy with the bits where he says, well, I think animals are outside the scope of justice, but I'm just going to put that to the side. I'll come, uh, it's not, not a big issue for me to worry about. And there were several other pieces in the, in the book that are a bit like that. And I wrote an essay for the MA on whether or not we ought to, um, whether we could build animals into Rawls' Theory. Mm. Um, I think not only did I read Midgley's work for that, but I also read uh, Peter Venz's book on environmental justice. And he talks about, um, so Rawls's famous thought experiment where you're trying to think about justice, trying to think about fairness, um, and you situate yourself behind a, it's a thought experiment behind the veil of ignorance. You imagine you're trying to come up with the rules of society, but you don't know where you're going to end up in society when you do that. Um, you don't know whether you're going to be poor, you're going to be rich, uh, you don't know your sex, you don't know whether you're going to have a disability, you don't know anything about yourself in that, in that regard. Um, and Venn suggests thickening that veil of ignorance so you don't know your species either. And that might give us reasons to include non-human animals within justice. So that was the first bit of scholarship I started thinking about writing about. Mm, wonderful. If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? So that's, uh, I, th- I think I would say John Hadley. Um, so John wrote this really, really interesting paper in 2006 uh, on the duty to aid non-human animals in dire need. And in that paper, he asks us whether there's any real uh, moral difference between non-human animals in dire need uh, and, I don't know, severely cognitively impaired humans in dire need uh, or children in dire need. Um, and his argument is that he doesn't think there is. Um, and it's, it was a really thought-provoking paper for me. I'd only thought about negative duties to animals, duties not to do them harm, duties to leave them alone. And this paper argues that we ought to go out and help them when they're in need. Um, and it was that paper that really got me thinking, so my supervisor get, suggested it to me, um, really got me thinking about my, about a PhD proposal. Uh, and it's what pr- prompted me to, to eventually put, spend a couple of lunch breaks putting together a PhD proposal um, on whether we have a duty to break the law in defence of non-human animals. Wonderful. So that paper sparked my PhD and quite a lot of my work since. Well, a big shout out to John Hadley, my friend and colleague and also former guest on this program. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? So, I, you know, this is a difficult one, right? Because academics often seem like there's not much we can do, right? And, and changing the world is really difficult, right? Really difficult. And slow. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think the first thing to do is, is not just... So, as academics, we, we can take the, the sort of comfortable assumptions that people have and give them a good old shake. So, I, I think a lot of what's really important about what we do is to just make people aware of the kind of background assumptions they're living under and the, uh, 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 and the patterns they've fallen into and make them think in new ways. And I think philosophy is particularly well suited to that. It gives us new concepts, new ways of thinking, new ways of understanding the world that can challenge our assumptions. Um, I think the other important thing to do is uh, it's not just as academics, but as people. 
but to live according to the values that we're talking about. I think I'd probably change more people's minds by cooking them dinner <laughs> yeah. uh, than and just you know talking about veganism or animal rights in conversation. You know, more I get I'm gonna talk to more people that way than I than ever will read my papers. Mm. Uh unless I'm incredibly successful. <laughs> <laughs> um so I think it's yeah, it's not just about it's about challenging and, and providing these sort of conceptual uh routes for people to think in new ways, but also about taking it into your private life and to your professional life and living according to the values that really matter. Mm. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human non human animal relationship, what would it be? I think this one's actually fairly easy for me. I think I would it, it's the it's the granting of rights of legal rights recognizing non-human animals as having legal personhood right so having rights for their own sake so not rights because they're someone's property and your so rights regarding animals you you harm someone because you've damaged their property but because they matter for their own sakes so the granting of that legal personhood and a set of rights to, that animals have themselves to go with it i think would be the the big thing that would change if mm. i could do one thing mm. Well, Steve, what are you working on next? So I've been, at the moment, I've been thinking about, so, so most of my work is about rights and duties. Um, but I've been trying to think about the character of society, um, about what kind of, what society would look like and how would we would describe someone who was a good person who work, worked with non-human animals, right? Um, and so I've been thinking in those terms about the structure of our relationships as a society with non-human animals. And a big part of that is that we, we, we try and encourage non-human animals to trust us in order that we make it easier for us to harm them. Mm. Right? So in farms, in laboratories, there's a lot of research going in on, on things like gentle touching, interactions with non-human animals that makes it easier, it calms them down. And on the one hand, that seems like it's good on a welfare ground, right? It, it reduces their stress. But really, the purpose of it is to make it e less dangerous for the handler or to make the meat less tough for the consumer. And it's a, when you start thinking about it, what kind of a person, what kind of a society on a mass scale tries to encourage trust in order to make betrayal easier? And that's, I mean, it's a difficult way for me to think of it as a, a rights based thinker um, to think more in terms of character and virtue but that's the area I'm going now at the moment thinking about trust and betrayal in relation to non-human animals and and seeing it as a pervasive feature of our society uh, and that raises interesting questions also about sort of some of the moves against factory farming so one of I mean factory farming horribly cruel we know that but some of the kickback says actually we should have more of a personalized less industrial relationship with non-human animals we should know them, we should care for them, we should touch them. There's something else that goes with that, and that's the formation of trust and the betrayal that comes with it. So it's not just a simple good. <laughs> um, so that's, yeah, that's the next area that I'm looking at at the moment. Wow. Well, it certainly sounds like you've got plenty of issues to cover off on there, yeah. Steve. How can people find out more about your work? Well, so I've got a got an academia.edu page, I've got a researchgate.net page and the University of Leicester I have a web page. So yeah. just Google me and it's the best option. Yeah. And you're on Twitter? Yeah, but that's, I mean, I don't use Twitter mainly for animal rights based stuff. Okay. That's just me to be grumpy and sweary most of the time. <laughs> okay, well, give that a miss then if you're, <laughs> if you're sensitive. Well, Steve, thank you so much for joining us for Knowing Animals. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals. We also have a Knowing Animals Facebook page and Instagram account. And as I said at the top of the program, leaving reviews on iTunes make it, makes it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals. <laughs>